despite the fact that this is my third time in your city, I still haven't learned how to speak Macedonian. So I'm going to speak English. How are you doing in English? Okay? Don't click or anything. Just say yes. Yeah, yeah out loud, really. Woo! Time is running out. This is me back then. You heard something about me, but uh, let me tell you, I'm one of the communist women <laughs> who survived communism and even laughed at the end, one who had no clue about reproductive health, reproductive rights, reproductive justice, and I started actually advocating for other women, one who had no idea about family planning, contraception, sexuality education, and I started teaching my own mother. And uh, I've, that's why, you know, the, the, the bad times I've had to live, unlike, unlike any of you here, have turned me into a fierce, even ferocious advocate for girls' and women's rights. And because I also, I'm a trainer, they call me the coach now. <laughs> but, um, and, uh, okay, one thing, today is September 28th, which is the International Safe Abortion Day. And that's why the color today is green. That's why I'm wearing green. So yes, that's why I'm wearing green. I'm gonna take you back 52 years ago, 52 years back in time to Ceausescu's era. Have you heard about Ceausescu? Good, now he's dead. That's another good thing. <laughs> but in 1966, he dealt a crippling blow to women of Romania by banning abortion on request, we call it now abortion on demand, abortion on request, or elective abortion. Because his concern was the low rate of population growth. And many other leaders actually invoked that. Because he actually wanted to raise the country's population from 23 to 30 million by the year 2000. Do you think he managed to do so? No. <laughs> But, and actually, Romania now stands at 19,000 population. But the thing was, any woman who was caught having an abortion or any abortionist would be imprisoned for at least two years. And he said something memorable, because he wanted to go down in history. He said, he proclaimed, the fetus is the property of the entire society. Anyone who avoids having children is a deserter, who abandons the laws of national continuity. And beware, because this kind of, uh, of uh, theory is coming back to haunt us. What was the impact of his policy? What do you see? Many babies. And the year after uh, he uh, uh, passed the, the ban on abortion, the, um, the fertility rate, the birth rate, nearly doubled in Romania. But guess what? Uh, they were calling it child production. So women were child producers. And child production became some kind of uh, evaluation criteria for doctors, for high-ranking officials, for uh, militia men, and even for medical doctors in high schools. And I'm gonna, as I'm gonna let you know a little later. That's another impact. I mean, many, many mothers, because Ceausescu made a mockery of family planning and contraception and sexuality education. Any book on sexuality was considered state secret, and they were allowed only as medical books. And because there were no contraceptives, and some people traveled outside the country, they smuggled contraceptives into the country. Who do you think these people were? Can you take a wild guess? Who? The government, the party leaders who were going outside would bring uh, this, and the artists and spokespeople. I mean, now, what do you take as a gift to somebody when you go to the duty-free shop? Whiskey, coffee, chocolate, something like that. Contraceptives were more valuable than any of these things put together. Oh boy. And, <laughs> but despite the, uh, the law, the next year, the birth rate started going down because women had to find a way to cope with the situation. But it was really very sad because the law only gave us permission to die. 
to, if we couldn't actually get to an abortion uh, provider. And uh, it was a question of uh, bleeding. The quantity of bleeding was either a salvation of, of a curse, because it depended on how much you bled. And if you got to uh, a, a bed like that in a hospital, women were being interrogated by the doctor with a prosecutor office right behind them to see the doctor opening the abortion kit to say what they had done to themselves or what somebody else had done to them and uh, therefore uh, go to prison. So they never told us uh, the, the, these secrets. And there were uh, women in the hospital, midwives and nurses who told them, don't say anything because it's not written on your forehead. And that's why this was kept a very good secret and uh, a very good um, uh, ab abortion network. But I'm gonna show you another impact of the abortion decree. Ab institutionalized children, abandoned, handicapped, institutionalized children, more than 25,000, and some numbers go up to 60,000 and 90,000. Do you know how many women actually are documented to have died due to illegal abortions. They call the numbers 10,000, but it's only the recorded numbers by the uh, prosecutors, not the real numbers of all the women who died at home. This is still going on, by the way, and uh, Romania has something like 10,000 institutionalized children per year. I'm gonna take you to show you abortion as a fact of life in Romania. Many Romanian, like myself, shared exactly the same story uh, because we couldn't have an abortion. Many women had, had to have babies. They were called decrete, or children of the decree, but the babies born as a result of the 1966 decree. But in order not to have any more babies, they had to cope with the situation and invent some kind of uh, method. So they invented the pipe, that round thing, is a pipe, it's called a sonda in Romania, but also sonda is the oil derrick in English. So it's the same word, that's why I put them together. And because of this similarity in Romania, there was a joke that was uh, going on in those miserable years. Uh, it went like this, which do you think is the richest country in the world? Romania, why? Because every woman has a sonda. Yeah, it's a sick joke, and the joke was on the women of Romania, but that was, that was the truth. And it became a do-it-yourself kind of thing. Every woman started, you know, they, they had to learn how to do that. And uh, what I'm showing you here in the third picture is an inventory of must-haves uh, during the communist era, and the last one is an abortion kit along with the communist newspaper, the uh, transistor radio, which I still have one, by the way, a pajama, uh, the famous uh, Bulgarian cigarettes, BT, uh, and a lot of uh, other things. And uh, <clears throat> I forgot to bring the transistor radio, but anyway, <clears throat> this is me in high school. And I had a memorable gynecological exam in high school. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I will never forget that day when they lined all the girls in 12th grade in front of the medical room of the school. And we were supposed to get checked <clears throat> to have a gynecological exam and to have a gyne the gynecologist look at a certain part of our body that no one had ever looked at before. I was scared. I was afraid, just like all the other girls. What? you know, what they were gonna see, what they were gonna write down after that kind of examination, what they would tell our parents. We didn't even know how you got pregnant at that time. We, there were rumors that maybe we had kissed and that's how we got pregnant. <laughs> yeah, they were, we were that stupid. And we, we were wondering, I was wondering, how come the boys don't need this kind of examination? What's the matter? Because we were supposed to have it before some kind of x-ray, so but I will never forget that one. And what I've heard a couple of days ago in Belarus, in Minsk, there are uh, doctors who are trying to do exactly that to the girls of Belarus. So I'm gonna go there and tell them my story. I'm gonna go on, this is not me, by the way. <laughs> but, but I'm gonna tell you my unforgettable illegal abortion. And, and it was provided by somebody who looked like her. Maybe it was her.
And uh, like most Romanian, my, <laughs> Romanian women my age, of course, I had, an, uh, had to have an illegal abortion. I got pregnant by using some kind of Russian-made, Soviet-made pills, actually, that burned like hell, but didn't prevent the, uh, the, uh, the pregnancy. So first, we had to have a lot of shots, very painful shots that were supposed to do something and dislocate the, uh, the fetus, but it didn't work like that. So somebody took me to a woman like that, who lived outside the city, far, far away in a country house, and she was boiling some metal things, metal objects on a nation stove, and she asked me to get up on the table. She put a rag in my mouth so as to prevent me from being heard if, in case I screamed, because it was all like, have you ever had anything live, you know, with no anesthesia? Think about that, no anesthesia. So she started doing what she was doing, and I was screaming in my mind, and I was so, oh, I was fed up, and I thought, it was going to be over, and I was thinking I'm never going to have sex again after that. But I went home, and guess what? The next morning, I started having morning sickness, and I was wondering, how could I still be pregnant after having an abortion? So, um, <clears throat> so actually, somebody else took me to an OBGYN, an obstetrician gynecologist this time, who finished a job on another kitchen table. And that's why that kind of procedure was called kitchen abortion. It's very sad. It really is very sad and very shameful. Have you ever heard any such story from your ma mothers, grandmothers, aunts? No? I'm telling you. Maybe not here, not in this country, but in Romania, many young girls don't even know, don't have a clue of what their mothers or grandmothers had to go through. And they should know these things. That's why I'm telling my, my own story to you today. But after that, <clears throat> we transitioned to contraception and sexuality education, and that was after he was dead. And we uh, had some uh, assistance, and uh, actually Romania ranked uh, first in the world in the number of abortions in 1990. We should probably be listed in the Guinness World Book of Records with our huge number, because women felt liberated. They took maternity hospitals by, by storm. You know, They thought they exercised their freedom to have an abortion as the only kind of fertility control, because that's all we had. But that's when we also started, that was my first advocacy campaign, Women Choosing Health, in 1989, uh, this photo. And um, here I am, the coach, because I'm trying to teach, my t-shirt reads, we want sexuality education in schools. And right now, I'm advocating as fiercely as I can for the application of sexuality education in schools or out of schools in public libraries, for instance. Because history, like memory, is not just an indicator for the past, but also for the future and, and for the present. And uh, that is how we can understand the impact of the draconian pronatalist policy in Romania. And, that, and the stigma that women have to bear to this day because not many women like myself have the guts to tell their story, because it's painful and shameful, but it shouldn't be at the same time. And the uh, abortion-related decree is the indicator that Romanian women had no right to self-determination. Speaking to you here today allows me to pay a tribute to the thousand of Romanian women who died from illegal abortions. I was the lucky one and got away with it and the thousand, thousands of thousands of children who became abandoned, institutionalized, and handicapped, and are still there in the institutions in, in Romania. And that also shows us that such illegal clandestine practices will always be a big problem of, uh, of public health. And I want this to be a warning to governments and parliaments who are now restricting women's rights to safe determination. And I thank you for supporting this cause, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for...
for translating. Thank you very much.